Welcome to Love for the Truth Radio, a program devoted to encouraging you to be a contender of the faith in an ever-changing church culture. On Love for the Truth Radio, we will discuss current issues and challenging views along with biblical truth that can affect our Christian worldview and how we live out our faith. And now, here's your host, Cindy Hartline. Welcome to the program. Do you have a love for the truth? I mean, biblical truth. Are you interested in a biblical worldview? If you are a believing, professing Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ in His ways, you should be. Love for the Truth Radio will offer that. So we thank you for listening to us now. You know, most Christians would agree that we are living in unprecedented times as grave lawlessness continues to rise. Right has become wrong and wrong has become right. You know, sadly, in our government, we see this happening. Much of our culture has lost its moral compass. And Generation Z has lost their identity with God, family, future, and sadly, with their own lives. Many don't know who created them and what they were created for. So my question is this, are we ripe for revival? You know, I believe so. And I'm excited about today's show because we will be revealing truth about an an event that had brought about some controversy within the Christian camp. I'm referring to the Asbury University revival that occurred in Kentucky in the beginning of this year. Was it an organized event or a true move of the Holy Spirit? Well, our guest, Laura Hunter, attended the event from beginning to end and has an endearing testimony to share with us. Welcome, Laura Hunter. It is a pleasure to have you on Love for the Truth Radio. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> so I- I'm so excited about this show, Laura. You have no idea because I wanted to know more about the Asbury Revival, and you are the perfect person to give the information because you were there. Why don't you share with our audience a brief bio in regards to your position at Asbury Seminary? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Um, I've actually worked at the seminary for 20 years in different capacities, but the last eight years, my job has been to, uh, to work in the family housing area. So my husband and I live in family housing with all the students. Mm. Uh, We have between four and 500 people living in our neighborhood at any given time. And so I create programming for all the children, the youth, the couples. I I work with spouses and do some formational program uh, with those who are not attending classes. Mm. And um, it has been a wonderful eight years. It's It's the best job I've ever had, I've decided. (laughs) That is so, so exciting. Um, So if you can give us more of a detail of how you are affiliated with, um, you know, some of the students. How did it come back? I mean, you work for the seminary, but you are also working for the university. Is that it? Well, actually, the university and the seminary are sister organizations. Okay institution. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, the seminary was birthed out of the university. Okay. The president of the university decided that he wanted a school just for pastors. And so, uh, it, in fact, this year we're celebrating our hundredth year as a seminary. Wow. Um, actually, our, I came to Wilmore, where the two institutions are, when I was three years old, when my dad was a student. So um, I came back to the university as a student myself, and our it, just within our family, starting with my dad, mm. uh, twenty of us have gone to the university oh, that's um, exciting. to get degrees. Um, you know, my siblings and their kids, and uh, now we're you know it's almost time for grandchildren to to start university. So. Uh, you know, and and many of us went across the street and ha- and are in ministry. Mm-hmm. Went to the seminary. My husband got two degrees at the seminary. I got several degrees at the seminary. So, um, you know, working at one institution, you're very connected to the other one mm-hmm. too. So it's just across the street. That's that's how I got over 
to the services, the revival, um, so quickly, because I was just across the street while it was happening. Oh, that's so exciting. You know, uh, just for our audience to know is, I heard Laura give her testimony on the Asbury Revival while I attended the Seville camp meeting. And I was so excited because uh, there's so many people out there that believe it's such a controversy of whether or not it was really a move of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So uh, did you, Laura, witness the Asbury Revival? Did you witness all of it? You said you're right across yeah. the street. You did. <laughs> well, you know, most of it. I wasn't there at the chapel service when it began. Mm-hmm. I was working across the street, and so I didn't get there until the evening, but I was hearing reports all day, mm. you know, um, of how it was going. And so when I finally got there uh, that evening, there were probably only 500 people in the building. So it didn't start with a large crowd, but there was definitely a difference when you walked into that room there mm. was a, you, you could sense that God was doing something new wow. so I, and then I was there the rest of the time I, I spent oh, I don't know up to 10 to 12 hours a day there mm. um, being on the prayer team and so I would come back and do some work that needed to be done oh and then goodness. go back to the <laughs> to the services so um, it was quite an experience to be a part of it. Mm. Yeah, and you had mentioned that you sensed a difference. Um, If you could at least paint a picture for our audience, what that felt like or looked like, that would be great. Yeah, I I don't know. Any words I would use would be inadequate to to what Mm. actually happened. But um, there was a sense of peace When you entered the room, Mm. there was uh, a sense of God's presence. It felt different. I've been to many revival services that Mm -hmm. were planned. Mm. I've been to many conferences, many um, churches where the Holy Spirit was was really moving. But this was a, um, a very calm, very peaceful atmosphere. It um, as soon as you walked in, you sensed that people were very hungry for God's presence. There was lots of prayer happening in pockets, lots of prayer up at the altar. Others were worshiping, and um, and it wasn't you know as you as you talk to other people coming and going, they sensed the same thing. I heard people saying that. As soon as they got to the stairs, hmm. they could they could sense God's spirit. So wow. it, it was very interesting to interview and talk to other people who were also there. Mm-hmm. And they were all saying the same thing. That's so. And I think what's so interesting is that there was a calm and peaceful spirit. And um, when you think of a revival, you think of a lot of action going on, a lot of signs right. and wonders, and people clapping and yelling and praising. And so this is uh-huh. really interesting uh, to hear that there were peace. it was peaceful. Yet we do know that Jesus is the Prince of Peace, so if His presence was there, right. He was bringing a peace to the people. So. I get. I don't even have to ask you this question. I was going to say, in your opinion, was the revival organized as an event by the university, or was it Holy Spirit inspired? <laughs> you know, did it did it start out as an organized event and then end up uh, being led by the Holy Spirit, or was it did it uh, originate from the Holy Spirit? It really, it really just happened. Hmm. Now, I do have to tell you this: um, Asbury University has experienced. 10 revivals wow. in their history hmm. from about 1905 when, hmm. when it began. And none of them were planned. Yet here's an interesting fact. That's interesting. I believe all of them, if not most of them, um, also happened in February, the month of February. Really? Hmm. Now, why? No one knows. No one really knows why. But... Um, they're never planned. 
the last one, well, there was one in 2006, but the, the big one that I remember in my lifetime was 1970. And that wasn't planned either. Hmm. It, it always seems to be that God responds to students who are hungry for his presence. Mm-hmm. And and he answers his people's desires. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's the revivals that I know about, too, have had people praying previously to the event. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, this one, there were many people praying that God would come in a new and fresh way. Um, and so, and they'd prayed for several years for that. Wow. Um, so everyone was surprised, really, when it happened. The the leadership at the university had no idea this was going to well, happen. Yeah, um, the president wasn't even there. He he was in meetings and um, had to be contacted uh, and said, "You need to come over here. Something is really happening." Oh my goodness, uh, it's so exciting! I can't imagine yeah, how he so- felt at that moment. I was just going to say, he, I heard his testimony, and he said after he realized he needed to come over and see what was happening, he walked out of his office, out of the front door, and he saw students running wow. towards the auditorium and running wow. up, the, up the stairs just to get in. And, you know, he said that moment he realized, oh, my goodness. Some, something is <laughs> going on here. get in there and see what God's doing. Oh, that's so exciting. And you know what's exciting, too, is for students to know that God is there, He's doing something new, and they want to hear it, to, to, to just picture them running, you know, towards the, the area where they were praying. Um, you had mentioned that, uh, that it seems to you, after your experiences, um, on, uh, you know, in reference to revivals, that the Holy Spirit responds to students who are hungry. That was the word that you said, hungry. Yeah. So what does yeah. that look like, students that are hungry? I mean, how do we know their heart? How do we know what they're praying for? Right. Well, you know, your, your typical college student, mm-hmm. um, they, they have chapel three times a week. And so the entire campus comes to it. And they come for an hour and then they leave. And go to a class. Okay. But typically, when it when they're released, everyone leaves. Mm-hmm. But this time, they decided to stay. There were about nineteen students who just felt like they needed to press in and and pray. Mm-hmm. And so, while they stayed praying, the gospel choir, who was leading worship, decided to stay and continue to worship along with them. Mm-hmm. And at some point in that extended time of prayer, one of the young men confessed some sin to a small group of students and said, I really just want to be forgiven and I want to confess this. And uh, all of those who were sitting around him said, after he had prayed and, you know, he, he felt he'd been forgiven, something happened in the room. They called it a change in the atmosphere, mm. and they all felt it at once. Mm. Interesting. Um, and and so they continued to pray and continued to pray. And, and so, you know, no, none of them got up to leave for lunch. They just kept praying. And eventually other students found themselves in the room, too. And that's when the text began going out to other students, saying, come to the, come to they call it Hughes Auditorium. It's their chapel. All right, Laura, we're going to continue on the next uh, segment, but we're going on a break. So we'll be right back. This is very exciting. Please stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. And so I hope that in my words, you hear nothing but praise and glory to him. In May, at the beginning of this year, I got invited to a conference in Lexington, Kentucky with some other student leaders across the country. And One of the things that we did is we came to this room and we got on our knees and we prayed that the Lord would do this right here. And I sat back in that corner and I laid on my face and I was begging the Lord to do something and and I wish I could tell you it was this hopeful, expectant prayer, but quite honestly it was the worst couple hours of my life because I was so consumed with the cost. 
I was so upset at everything that he was asking me to say no to. That's everything he was asking. I, I cried at the loss of everything that I felt like he was taking from me. And, and in this moment right now, I just want you to know that when you step into the fullness of an answered prayer, the cost is so light. And so as we leave this place in a little bit, and you feel the cost of what the Lord is asking you to say no to, I urge you, brothers and sisters, do not see it as a no, but see it as a, as a yes that he is asking you to step into. There is a world out there that has no clue of the goodness that you and I have felt in this place. Welcome back. I'm Cindy Hartline, your host. If you like our shows, please be sure to subscribe and hit that bell so you can be informed when a new program is posted. And be sure to check out our website, lovefortheTruthRadio.com. That's lovefortheTruthRadio.com. And there you will find all of our show archives, as well as our current programs on the front page on the Jesus Revolution Revival. Interviews with Gregory Reed, Chuck Gerard, who was in Love Song, the renowned music group that you see in the Jesus Revolution movie. So go see it if you haven't. And by the way, Chuck Gerard informed me that a movie on Love Song will be in the theater soon. So keep a lookout for that. Well, our guest today is Laura Hunter. She is here to testify of her experiences during the Asbury University revival in Kentucky. Laura was there. Welcome, Laura, to Love for the Truth Radio again. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, and you've given us a whole wealth of information, and we're excited to hear more. So you mentioned something changed after a student confessed his sin. Do you believe that was when the revival began, or was it after a sermon, worship, prayer? Uh, you know, also, you know, tell us about the students that prayed. Yeah, I, I, I do believe that's when God's Spirit uh, mm. came in a fresh way. Wow. They had just finished a chapel service, okay. and the preacher had preached. He, he actually used the sermon text of Romans 12, 9 to 10. It was all about letting love be genuine and hate what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Mm. I, I, um, love one another with brotherly affection outdo one another in showing honor. And he talked about what real love is. Mm. So the ones that stayed were really asking to know what real love is. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but but nobody, you know, the, the speaker, he's really a wonderful man, loves Jesus so much. Mm -hmm. But he even admitted it wasn't a great sermon. And it was funny to hear other people up on the stage saying, you yeah, know, the sermon was just kind of, well, just kind of a normal sermon. Nothing big happened there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow! And, and uh, you know, and the fact that most of the uh, of the whole school left to leave for classes and mm -hmm. for lunch, but uh, you know, God decided otherwise. And so, those nineteen were the first ones to sense that God was doing something new. And then over time, more and more students came back. Mm -hmm. The administration came. The professors started letting people out of classes. And, um, and then, you know, within an hour or so, we over at the seminary heard, were hearing uh, some of the news about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it really apparently didn't have anything to do with the service that had just happened. But. Uh, something happened when when those students sat there and mm -hmm. and prayed. Yeah, yeah. And when you, the student confessed his sin, I mean, you know, we are to confess our sins one to another. The Bible says, and how often do we do that? I mean, yeah. you know, you might find it in a small, you know, Bible study where everybody knows one another, but uh, openly and publicly, it's very, very right. rare for someone to confess but their sin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that started uh, that started more students confessing, okay. and sharing testimonies, and so that continued the whole revival. Mm. Oh, they, wow. they would have specific times where they would call people up to share a testimony, mm -hmm. and in many of those times, they would share what God was doing in their life, what what they'd been struggling with, and so they would confess what they were struggling with. And it was really interesting because after that testimony, 
the person holding the microphone would say, is there anyone else struggling Mm -hmm. with this issue? And there were four specific things that came up through Mm -hmm. the whole time, all 16 days. Wow. And uh, yeah, and it's, it's kind of how this generation has been defined. Mm-hmm. When they talk about Gen Z, they say that they're depressed, they're anxious, they're lonely, and many are suicidal. And those four things kept coming up. And wow. there would be healings from all of those, those issues. People would stand all around the room saying, yes, I've struggled with that too. And so people would reach out and put their hands on them and pray over them as someone prayed from the front of the room. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there were real healings and chains being broken. Uh, So it was was quite remarkable to -hmm. to see this young generation who's who's been tagged with those those maladies, those, Mm -hmm. you know, that brokenness, to see them testifying to how God had changed all of that. Wow. So interesting. Um, I just did a, a show recently on the history of revivals, and uh, the gentleman that was on the show said that there's always a counterculture or from past history, a track record, that there was mm-hmm. always a counterculture that rose up just before a revival or, or it made them ripe for revival. And you know, you look at these kids and you say, man, what they're going through. I mean, they're, oh, yeah. they're losing their identity, like who they are, you know, their purpose, where they come from, broken families, you know, the, the whole thing. I can, I could see where there's a lot of brokenness, anxiousness, uh, being depressed and suicidal. But you know what? Thank God that these kids were able to confess that, you know, and, yeah. and, and, and look for help ask for help, you know, and then to see those healings. Wow, that's so exciting, Laura. It it really was. That's so, so exciting. Yeah, these kids have also, you know, they were so affected by COVID. Yes, that's it too, Um, yeah. Isolated, kept at home, you know, not able to socialize. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I still don't think we've seen all uh, all that well, that has happened to people since mm-hmm. that time. And, and so, you know, they were being honest about who they were and how they were affected, what men- mental illness was uh, very prevalent. Mm-hmm. And and so God was reaching in and, and just bringing healing one right after another. And then they would share those testimonies. So uh, the whole time was filled with worship, testimony, mm. scripture reading, mm. um, prayer, and mm. and also some preaching of the Word, too. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. When uh, you say preaching of the Word, was that the pastor preaching in between what these kids well, were talking about, or were they preaching the Word? <laughs> well, it was all of that. Okay, um, wow. Well. They would, in the evening, it was very different. The rhythm uh, kind of changed all day long. Mm-hmm. And in the evening, there would be someone from leadership would share uh, would share a sermon, but they were all they were very elementary sermons because it, and they were discipleship, and so mm-hmm. they would talk to the students primarily about how to grow in your faith, mm-hmm. and they would talk about how the church needs a renewal and how to be a witness and. Um, it was it was really it was exciting to sit through those services. Now, at the beginning, I was able to hear a lot of the sermons. Mm-hmm. Once I once I started on the prayer team, uh, the people on the prayer team are on one side of the altar, and the and everyone else comes up to the altar to pray. And mm-hmm. so, we prayed through most of what was happening. There was a there was a vague understanding that someone was either speaking or testimonies were happening, but we just continued to pray for people because they would be in lines waiting mm, to, to have to have prayer. So I don't know all of the topics while we were praying because the lines to pray never stopped. That's so interesting. Wow. And and yeah. just the worship kept going, the testimonies kept being spoken, <laughs> the preaching of the word was following suit. And there was a real rhythm there of the Holy Spirit, I believe. 
And you know, yeah. it's interesting, you know, you think of the scripture that says we overcome or they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. You know, I think people Absolutely. need to hear others testify of where they came from, how God is changing their life, you know, how they need healing. Because when there's a brokenness, you know, you always feel like you're the one, the only one that's going through it. And when you hear that every there's so many other people that are going through the same things, it kind of brings you together in one accord to pray and to reach out yeah. to the Lord. You know, that is, that's so interesting. And you were talking about how that sermon was love one another. So when you think about that, that was the real love. You know, mm -hmm. um, that that kind of really set the premise there that we need to love one another. And when you start giving your testimony and confessing, I mean, you're talking about intimacy now. You're talking yeah. about people coming together with like mindedness and one in heart, one in spirit. So, you know, maybe we should, <laughs> maybe our church should be <laughs> like that, you know, instead of one person or one pastor speaking. When you really think about it, you, you the members of the body of Christ assemble together with their different gifts, sharing uh, what they have or what the Holy Spirit's telling them to to share or sharing their most intimate uh, testimonies. I think there's a freedom there, for it's my opinion, yeah. a freedom there for the Holy Spirit to work. And it's yeah. like we're not getting in His way, in other words. <laughs> you know? Exactly. One of the marks mm -hmm. of this time, and then, you know, that Asbury's not calling this a revival, they're calling it an outpouring. Oh. Because a, re a revival mm, interesting. can only be named looking backwards. A <sighs> revival isn't just a series of services, it changes a generation. Wow. You know, a okay. revival uh, spreads, you mm -hmm. know, uh, mm -hmm. like there's all these markers for true revival. It won't just stay in one place. It will move to other places. Mm -hmm. It will, it, it will continue. The people who are involved in the revival will, will meet with other people, will share it and it'll spread like, mm -hmm. like wildfire, mm -hmm. you know? So looking back, Someday they may say this is a this is the mark of a true revival, um, mm -hmm. but being a part of it, one of the things that marked the this event was humility. It was humility on the stage. There was humility on the part of the leaders, and even just sharing your own vulnerability mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. brokenness was a was a humility that yeah. you don't see. Right. In many services. You know? No, no. Well, there's not really a, a, an opportunity to even speak in most cases. Right. You know, right. to even share your heart. And yet people are sitting there, you know, and it's probably going through their minds and their hearts as they're praying to God or praying without ceasing. But we need to we need to hear and see. Uh, I think of that scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good, yeah. you know, taste and see. Well, how do we do that unless we see the Holy Spirit move from one person to another or one group to yeah. another or in the midst of us? So well, I really pray that we learn from this, Laura, you know, that uh, I know that when we had small groups, we've always allowed others to share what was on their heart. But anyway, we are going on a break, so that was perfect timing. We'll be back okay. with Laura Hunter who continues to share her testimony of what the Asbury, I was going to say revival, but excuse me, what the Asbury outpouring was like. So please stay tuned. We'll be right back. I'm going to briefly talk about God's gift of kindness, which leads to repentance. For the last two weeks, we have been given the gift of God's kindness and have experienced an outpouring of his love. As a result of this kindness being poured out, we have experienced radical humility and repentance. Repentance is one of the intended outcomes of receiving God's kindness, as we see this in Romans 2, 4, which says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God has been meeting with us in a kind and gentle way that has overwhelmed us with his love in the natural reaction that is repentance. We have seen this since day one. So many students gathered at the altars or in their seats that were confessing sins and turning from ungodly patterns in their life, not because of worship, not because of a, an awesome sermon. Sorry, Zach. Uh, not because of a, a, a perfect worded altar call, but because they experienced God's love and kindness, which led to repentance. They experienced godly sorrow rather than worldly sorrow, which 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. 
We are back with Laura Hunter, who shares her testimony of what the Asbury Revival was like. And we've heard so much about it already. And uh, I, w- I want to be a part of a, well, she calls it an outpouring, not a revival, but I want to be a part of something like that. Do you? We need to pray for it. Pray, be hungry more for Jesus and start praying for his presence and change to come, especially in America. You know, Laura, what was the spiritual climate like as the re- revival or the outpouring continued? You know, did it did it get less and less? Did it rev up more? Were there more people coming? Were there less people coming? Give us a picture. Yeah, um, that was interesting. For the first few days, maybe three or four days, it was really college students, uh, seminary students, Wilmore townspeople. You could look around the room and, since I've lived here so long, recognize most most people. Mm-hmm. Um, but as, you know, they, they talked about this being the first, at least the first Asbury revival slash outpouring mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> that, that had social media involved in. Okay. And so... Um, You know, like for instance, the 1970 revival, it had a huge impact on that generation, Mm -hmm. but nobody found out about it. I mean, you got some phone calls, but you didn't find out in time to get there for it. This was on social media. People were watching it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it, it quickly rose to about... You know, they've had several estimates. One estimate was 50,000 people Mm. came. Mm -hmm. Another one is 100,000 people came. Um, But they had over 200 million people on Facebook watching it. So so there was a lot of press that the college, the college had nothing to do with the press. In fact, they were stopping the press from coming into the building and they they asked people to please don't live stream this. This is a this is a you know a personal mm-hmm. um, experience with the Lord. We don't want onlookers. Yeah, you know we want what people who are experiencing it here and now. Um, and so it did get more intense mm-hmm. um, as people came. That that building holds fifteen hundred people. Mm-hmm. So when you think about those numbers, yeah. Uh, people, there were long lines outside, wow. but I, I sometimes would walk through the lines. We would, we would take turns praying for the people who were in line. Mm-hmm. There were many people that waited ten to twelve hours to oh get my into goodness. the building. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and and the <laughs> the atmosphere outside was just as wonderful. There were some people who never got in. Hmm. Um, but it was so beautiful outside too. There were there were groups praying. The people in line were meeting each other. Um, I know of one young man who, when he finally got to the altar, uh, was saved outside. He stayed hmm. 10 hours with two other men he didn't know, and they led him to the Lord. Oh, that's beautiful. And, um, and, and everyone was happy out there. Sometimes, At one point, it snowed. Another point, it rained all day long, and hmm. people hung in there just waiting to get inside. Hmm. It, uh, but it was beautiful out there. People were laughing. There were people worshiping. They That's finally awesome. got jumbotrons outside so that people could watch what was happening inside. Oh, that's great. Yeah, and experiencing mm. that. But there were so many people that the seminary had to open up their buildings for mm-hmm. the people that wanted to come. Mm-hmm. So there were two chapels open, uh, the cafeteria, the gymnasium, you know, <laughs> and then about three of the churches in town open their sanctuaries. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was a lot of logistics that had to happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, when you're not used to that many people in a specific <laughs> town, in a specific area. That was my next question. I was wondering, did other churches open their doors? You know, that um, that's interesting. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, you, you figure how, how many people do you think came into town? Was about fifty thousand, you said, or yes, yeah. At, at by the Saturday, the last Saturday, there had been fifty thousand, mm-hmm. and then they went on until Thursday after that. But at that point, mm-hmm. uh, the police shut the city down. I think that's kind of historic. Oh wow! <laughs> I didn't. I did not hear that. Wow. Yeah. 
they closed off all entrances into the city and wow. they had a big uh, sign that a marquee that said the city has reached its capacity. Please turn around and go home. Oh, my. I've never <laughs> heard of anything like that. I hope somebody took a picture. I would love to see yeah. that. Wow, yeah. that is so there interesting. Is well, we were wondering yeah. how the city handled that, you know, especially having that many people come in. You know, you mentioned that in the beginning there was a real spirit of peace, but then you said that there were, I believe you said that there were people weeping. Yeah. And that leaders didn't know what to do. Can you expand on that? Yeah, well, they. I'm not sure if the leaders... Now, I was not part of the leadership. Okay. I was on the prayer team. And so, you know, I, I spent my days and evenings just praying for people. But um, in talking with the leaders, they they really didn't... You know, you'd think with that many people, they'd have to have, you know, somebody that kind of kept silence or kept the kept the mood of the room. It was it was actually very easy. People were very welcome to weep. They would come to the altar and most people were crying by the time they got to the altar. Mm-hmm. Some people would mm-hmm. would go to their knees as soon as they entered the room. Um, but all of that was in repentance. Mm-hmm. And and then there was a lot of joy happening simultaneously, especially with the Gen Z uh, students, Mm -hmm. they were very vibrant in their worship. And so uh, because it's an old building, they would have to ask anybody that was jumping while they worship to come down to the main floor. (laughs) Oh, wow. They were afraid that the balcony balcony might possibly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my goodness. But people were so respectful, Mm. Um, Mm. just really beautifully respectful, respectful outside and inside. Mm. Um, They deferred one another. There was no real show, nobody trying to, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, take over and and make a show of things. It just had a, had a, you know, the other word that people used along with peaceful was sweet. Isn't God's presence Mm. sweet? And I heard that over and over again. It's a funny thing to to hear. You don't hear that often. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we know that the Holy Spirit is gentle and Jesus is kind and it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Absolutely. You know, so to hear that sweet word, that kind of lines up, right? Uh, does, we we don't it? often feel that. And uh, you said the leaders didn't know what to do, but then you said everything seemed to go calm and it kind of fell into place and it wasn't like they were like, yeah. oh my gosh, we need more leaders. Let's, you know. Um, no, in, in fact, you never knew who the leaders were. Oh, interesting. Um, I remember that people would come up to make announcements. They would give their first name. Um, even the president of the university, when he would come up to mm-hmm. share something, he would say, hey, my name's Kevin. We're just happy you're here. Thanks for joining us. We hope God meets you. And, you know, and you're like, yes, you're Kevin, but you're also the president of the university. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but but you know they called many people called this the nameless and faceless I like revival. Wow. wow! And I thought that's really true. No one was trying to make a show of it. The um, there were mm-hmm. many very well known Christian mm-hmm. leaders there and worship leaders, and none of them had time on stage. Mm-hmm. They uh, they just sat and enjoyed God's presence mm-hmm. along with the the rest of the people there. Mm-hmm. Well, that tells you something, doesn't it? You know, when we, it when does. the human part of us or the fleshly part gets involved, you know, we quench the Holy Spirit sometimes. Right. You know, so the, I love that. I remember you saying that to me that, you know, there was no one was, uh, you know, acting proud or they were, you know, being seen or those that were renowned. I, I love that. So you did mention, you, you know, and share with us the story about that woman who testified that she always felt alone. Do yeah. you remember telling me that story? Yeah. Yeah, that was a really beautiful moment. Mm. Um, I, I so enjoyed listening to these young people share mm-hmm. and share how God had changed their life. This this one woman was still, she, she, I call her a woman, and she is a woman. She's a very young college student. Mm-hmm. And um, she talked about how she'd been at the school for at least a year and felt alone, mm. always felt alone. She said, I feel like I 
I walk around and no one even sees me. Oh, wow. And and then she, you know, she said, I'd ask God, you know, to come and heal that. And and I believe that he's the God who sees, just like in the story of Hagar. Mm-hmm. And as she was speaking, this is still early in in the time. They were mostly students. They began to stand up and they would they would call out to her, I see you. That's beautiful. I see you. Oh, and that that happened around the room. And it touched so many people. It it seemed like every time something like that happened, those who were experiencing the same thing would be touched mm-hmm. and then they'd begin to cry. And so mm-hmm. people would gather around them and pray for them. And and uh, healing started to happen around the room when one person would confess or or have a prayer request. Mm-hmm. Another one uh, that was really interesting, a young boy who had graduated, he was an international graduate. He said, I, I spent everything I had to get here. I, I haven't been able to find a job since I graduated. And I just came because I knew God was going to meet me here. It's beautiful. And as he was talking, someone from the balcony called out his name and threw money down oh my on the stage. Oh, in I could front cry. Wow. Well. <laughs> Immediately. Wow. Oh, without thinking, mostly students started running to the stage mm-hmm. with their own cash and throwing it onto the stage oh, at God. his feet. Wow. And, oh, I could cry. <laughs> it makes me cry yeah. on that one. Oh, gosh. It reminds me of Acts. You know, that there was no need. Exactly. Everybody fulfilled each other's exactly. needs. Boy, you know, I long for that, Laura. I totally long for that. For the community that we know yeah. exists in Christ that was we often cannot find even in church, you know? Yes. Yeah. And uh, boy, what a beautiful, beautiful story. The need was met right then and there. And guess what? People are so excited to help with those needs. Yes. You're being a part yes. of something that God wants you to be a part of. You're not made to do it. You're giving because the Holy Spirit unctioned you to do it. Boy, I just love that. Um, how, how did you... <laughs> I'm, I'm like ready to cry. I don't know if I can keep talking, <laughs> but how did you react to all of that, what was happening? Were you able to contain yourself? <laughs> yes, I was so moved, mm. and um, and it was it was a beautiful thing that I was able to be there as often as mm. I could be there. Whenever I was not in the middle of a program um, or in a meeting, I could be over there, and mm. it was just such a sense of gratitude. Mm-hmm. I, you know, when my family left Wilmore in 1968. It was two years later that revival came to Wilmore. And, you know, I was, it was just, I was such a privilege to be there this time in this moment. I kept thanking God the whole time. Thank you, Jesus, for letting me experience this and, and see your presence like this. Well, we're going on a break, so it's getting really awesome. Please stay tuned. You don't want to miss the end. We want to encourage you to. So let's pray for an outpouring. We need it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, we read that men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. They will be ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Thank you for having a love for the truth. Welcome back. Laura Hunter shared a wealth of information about the Asbury outpouring slash revival today. And we're going to wrap this up. But boy, you know, that's so interesting. I think we're going to learn a few things from this. Uh, you know, Laura, in reference to, you know, I started to weep when you were telling the story about this young man that didn't have a job. He couldn't mind. Here, here people are throwing money down from the balcony and, and students running up to the stage to give their money. And, and you were saying that a professor, what did that professor uh, say? Yeah, I was I was standing outside. We were part of the team praying 
with the outside people. Mm-hmm. And uh, this college professor said, well, now I know this thing is real. <laughs> college students do not give up their cash for anything. It's interesting. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, we know, you know things are really different. What I love is so far what I was hearing, and maybe we can hold on to, is that there was a, a peace, a sweetness. It was calm. And, you know, when we think of Jesus, you know, we the scripture says that it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. You know, that's a spirit. It's a spirit of Christ, you know, okay. and we don't often see that or feel that. It's very interesting. You said that uh, people were coming from everywhere, even out of the country. Yeah, there were many countries there. Wow. And even after the, the services, the outpouring closed, there were still people coming because they'd already made their plane flight. Mm -hmm. Um, And so from all over the uh, one country that was there in vast numbers was Brazil. And Mm -hmm. many of them brought their Brazilian flags. I had one person lay their flag down on the altar and they said, all I want you to do is lay your hands on this flag and pray for my country. And uh, and so that, that was a really interesting, there were some interesting themes um, I, I led a little girl who really only, she told me she spoke Russian and Spanish mm-hmm. in, in the halt of English, and I was able to lead her to the Lord. She was 10 years old, mm-hmm. um, but many people from, from other countries there, and it was very sweet to see um, mm-hmm. how engaged and in awe they were of mm-hmm. what God was doing and and wanting to take it home with them, and that was, you know, that's what we believe God planned all along, mm-hmm. was that they, people would come and they would go and they would, it would, it would spread like fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, have you heard anything about it spreading or will these people keep in touch or it's just something that we shouldn't even yeah. ask or know about? Um, we have. And I, I remember mm-hmm. in the 1970 revival, mm-hmm. they sent people out. And mm-hmm. that's actually how I got saved. Um, some of a team from Asbury University came to my church. I was 10 years old mm-hmm. and I was saved just from their stories, just hearing about what God was doing. And so was a, a large number of our church body was mm-hmm. saved that, that um, during those testimonies. And so um, this summer, there's been a lot of traveling people from both the seminary and the university have gone all over the world. Hmm. sharing about uh, about the outpouring and, and what God did. And there have been lots of signs of renewal. Immediately it started happening. Mm-hmm. There were 250 universities represented oh, wow. that came That's during a- that time. Yeah, wow. and uh, countless countries mm-hmm. came. But we heard, we've heard beautiful testimonies of how it began in their area too, in their university or mm-hmm. in their church. There's mm-hmm. been some really wonderful stories about it moving. I love that. I love that. Well, bring it here, Laura. <laughs> yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> bring it here. You know, you mentioned that um, that there were there were so many people, of course, but you say they saved seats up front. For the Gen Z students or the Gen Z people that were, uh, uh, what was it, 25 and younger, you said, that they were yeah, saving? Yeah. Yeah. That's Teenagers so interesting. Up to 25. Did they, I guess that was the Holy Spirit, you know, saying, you know, these are the people that need to be really ministered to more than yes. maybe the others. Hmm. Yes. And the, and the college was such good stewards of that. Mm. They, they, you know, this is where it started. This They truly believed, I believe too, that this was meant for this generation. Mm. And so all of the older generations, we, we just enjoyed the spillover of God's spirit. You know, mm. yes. uh, for me, watching young people be mm-hmm. healed and redeemed mm-hmm. and renewed was such a faith builder for me. I I remember even my prayers as I prayed at the altar, I felt, what is happening to me? I have such a strong faith that this healing that I'm praying for will happen. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a, uh, the the spillover was very powerful, Mm -hmm. that God's presence was there. He was moving and he wanted to move. Um, Yeah. So, it, it, you know, the, at first they just saved sections. Mm-hmm. Then um, 
partway through, I don't know how many days it was, they finally closed the auditorium for anyone older than 25. That's interesting. And, and, that's, and those people stayed outside while their family members came in. Mm-hmm. And they went across the street or to a church. And so we had prayer teams in all of these venues mm-hmm. praying for people. And, um, and they were watching a live feed of what was happening in Hughes. Mm-hmm. At first we thought, oh, well, let's do our own thing in these other places. And people were saying, we want to know what God's doing there. And so, mm-hmm. uh, so we do a live feed in all of those venues so people could watch the worship, mm-hmm. listen to the testimonies. And then all of those venues, there would just be prayer teams praying over people and people worshiping. Um, it was really, it was really a beautiful experience. My life has been changed forever, I mm. think. <laughs> mm. Wow. So when they brought in uh, the, the ones that were 25 and younger, uh, you saw them participate in the worship in the, uh, yes. yeah. Hmm. You know, I, yes. I look at this generation and I think I said it to you and I might, may have said in the beginning of the show is that, you know, the enemy is seeking whom he may devour. We know he robs, steals, and destroys. And you think of this generation where, again, they have blended families or they have split families. They don't know Mm -hmm. where they came from. Maybe the roots aren't there, where they're going. They're told that they can be a a male or a female or of their choice. So they're losing their identity of who God made them to be. You know, and so when you see uh, something like this happen, you say, oh, Lord, you know, you know, these kids, they need it. They need it so bad. So it really Mm -hmm. uh, warms my heart that that was seen and they allowed them to come in and be ministered to and lives to be changed. It's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Another mark Mm -hmm. was relationships that were healed. Mm. Mm. Um, the loneliness, the anxiety, the depression, you can imagine how that affects relationships. Yeah. And so uh, uh, there were a lot of testimonies about, uh, you know, in college language, how I hated so-and-so, or I, I never liked them, and how God came and warmed my heart, and um, mm. now we're friends, and now, you know, just hugging this person lets me know that God is real and true, mm. and that love comes from him. Mm -hmm. One of the testimonies, uh, one of the speakers said, some of you have broken relationships with your families. Mm -hmm. And so they prayed over the students and they said, if you believe God wants you to reconcile with a family member, take your phone outside on the steps and call your family. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm. Large numbers. Oh, wow. I I I got to chill on that one. Mm, I (laughs) got to chill on that one. Ooh. Yes, all these students out on the steps with phones oh, crying, wow. you know. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There's so many wonderful moments. You're calling yes. these markers. What wonderful moments, how these, it, it, it almost seems like everyone was met by the Lord, where they were yeah. at, what they needed, and the heal, you know, the healing that they, they needed right then and there. You know, you, you also mentioned how God provided Everything like water, food, mints, you know. Yeah. Uh, how did that yeah. come about? You, you know, as you can imagine, the, mm-hmm. the university did not have ready funds mm-hmm. to deal with that many people in a two week period. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, like they would notice a need and then God would provide. People were staying in the auditorium so long, they weren't eating or drinking. Mm-hmm. And so people came from all over Wilmore and the Lexington area and would bring large quantities of bottled water and snack food. And then companies started coming with food for all of the volunteers Mm -hmm. because the volunteers, even if they wanted to get home, they couldn't get to their car. Mm -hmm. There weren't parking spaces. And if your car was there, you couldn't get out. Mm -hmm. So so people were coming and bringing large quantities of food. People came from all over with food trucks just to give out free food. No one charged any money. What a beautiful um, moment. Just... I'll tell you, what a beautiful... <laughs> I, I really hope that somebody took video of this. And then again, if it was the Holy Spirit, you may not want to. But, you know, just to remember what God yeah. had done. I mean, this is... I mean, we we did speak briefly, but the more and more you're telling me of what transpired, it just... I, 
I'm got chills all the way down my back. You know, it's just to see like, wow, you know, I could see why people were weeping. It was like something that, you know, you long for, you long to see that, you know? It was intergenerational too. People were there Mm -hmm. with small children and elementary school children and high school kids, Mm -hmm. and they were all connected. Mm -hmm. I was there with my 10-year-old granddaughter one of the first nights, and we were looking up at the very, very tall ceiling, really high ceiling with with stained glass windows. And she looked over at me and said, wouldn't it be wonderful if so many people came to bring their friends to Jesus, they had to bring them down through the roof. Oh, yeah, look at that. Yeah. And then yeah. You just, wow. And, and, you know, within a few days, we watched it happen. You know, we watched mm. people bringing their family members there and... And it felt prophetic, you mm-hmm. know, when I when I remembered what she was saying. Yeah. It, they practically needed to come through the roof because they couldn't get in any other they way. They couldn't get in any other way. Wow. So um, you had mentioned uh, this was a two-week event, right, that just seemed to— Yeah. Did, like, 16 what, days. It was how many days? 16. 16 days. Did they have to, did did you, did you feel the the Holy Spirit like kind of leaving? I don't know if that's the proper way to say it, but leaving, or did you have, did they have to end it because uh, it was getting to be too much in the town? Like how, how did that happen? Yeah. I honestly believe it, it, it it could still be continuing Mm. to this day. It was that strong. There were still thousands and thousands of people outside on that last evening, but you know, once the police had closed down the city and I mean, there weren't enough porta potties, that's right. That, that's, you know, I mean, yes. there, it just wasn't enough space for good health mm-hmm. and safety. Although I know of no instance where anyone was harmed or anyone was in danger, it was still a security risk. You know, they we eventually had to get security officers just to check bags before mm-hmm. people came in and um and and that even that they were volunteers mm-hmm. um i remember the billy graham um the cove from billy graham they sent their security officers to work for us for free and and other places donated their security officers just mm-hmm. to come and help mm-hmm. uh, because the crowds were so large but mm-hmm. you know the, it, even with the calm atmosphere they wanted to be vigilant. To oh, absolutely. The college students mm-hmm. think that it's their minors. Some of those mm-hmm. are, are minors. And, um, and, you know, eventually the school had to make a really hard decision that they are a university and their primary purpose is to care for the college students mm-hmm. and to give them an education. Right. And, 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 you know, logically, God knew that when he showed himself at a university, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. he wasn't saying, oh, what a shame, I want to stay here longer, <laughs> yeah. you know, but, <laughs> but he knew, and, and God's heart, too, is that this would spread, that mm-hmm. it would be in many countries, in many cities, in many towns, mm-hmm. um, and so the last night, um, it was just as vibrant, maybe more so, mm-hmm. than than any of the days or nights, it was just as full, was just as long a line. And, you know, they, they, they were thankful that God showed himself in this way, but they said, it's now time for you to take all of this with you mm-hmm. and go in God's presence mm-hmm. to, to share this with others. Mm-hmm. And so we, we stayed to the very last minute when they, um, you know, when the last few people left. And um, it was it was just as beautiful then. There was no, you know, in the Old Testament, when Moses had to cover his face so mm-hmm. so that people wouldn't see God's glory leaving. Yeah, there there was none of that. Yeah, you know, God's glory was just as beautiful. In fact, the people who came after it closed down, um, they had to lock the doors of of Hughes Auditorium because people were trying to come in even after the. Mm-hmm. after it was ended. And so so groups would come from other countries and the school would take them in, allow them to spend time in there and pray. And um, and that's been going on ever since then. People can, people can come and they'll send someone in 
with mm. you, but uh, strange days, isn't it? Um, yeah. When people are so hungry, they'll, you know, they'll get on a plane uh, just to experience what God's doing. Mm-hmm. Well, it really speaks volumes to us because it's just like you said, the students were hungry, but I think everyone's hungry right now. You know, going through what we went through, um, yes. uh, the riots or whatever, um, you know, we need it. Anyway, we, we don't have much time left, so I want to encourage our listeners. You've given us a wealth of information, Laura, and thank you so much for sharing your heart, share, sharing what you saw took place, what it felt like, the climate. You really gave us a perfect picture. And I pray that just listening to the show, that we would take out uh, to the streets, to whatever, what we've heard, tell the stories, tell the testimonies, mm-hmm. what it was really like. Because, again, there was a lot out there that said they weren't sure if it was a real revival. Well, it was a real revival, a real outpouring. I want to thank you listeners for listening to our show once again. Please stay tuned. We have a lot more to come. But we are talking about revival. This has been our series. We need it. Pray for it. Please pray for it. We need it. Pray for your teens and the younger generation, especially Generation Z. So we want to encourage you, just uh, be still and know that He is God. God bless you.